I'm on. There we go. All right. So, guys, I would like for you to start the homework question answering process, um, but I would like to end because the way that we ended class last time did not provide enough of a conclusion for you to actually answer some of the questions in homework. But then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use those questions, which probably you muscled through just because you can problem solve. We're gonna use those as the connecting point to what we're going to do in the next three class periods. Um, so remember today, I know, well, we talked about this, that we were going to do test rewrites today, but because we needed to buy up this day to talk about some information to tee up the ball for the lab, we're gonna do content today well done. We're, I got a mean golf swing. Do you want to see? It goes like this. Uh huh? All right. So we're going to tee up the ball today. And then, guys, Friday, which is also going to be a short day, but an even more disrupted day because it's going to be the homecoming assembly. That's when we're going to do test rewrites. And then when I see you the following Tuesday, we're going to wrap up the conversation that we're going to start in about five minutes. So it's going to go new material today, rewrite Friday, finish today's conversation on Tuesday. And and that's all going to link back to the homework questions that I would like to look at. But with that said, what would you like to look at? I think you guys should. We're going ladies first, and we're going to go west to east. Go ahead, Eleanor. Hold on. That might be one I want to talk about. It is, but keep going. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Um, so, guys, looking back, and it's what number is this? 45? Yeah, so it says, when the solutions containing silver ion and chloride ion are da-da-da-da-da, and then C says, calculate delta H when this many moles of silver chloride dissolves in water. Um, I want, I'm going to answer the conceptual issue with this question, but then in a minute I want to talk about the math. So, guys, shame on the rest of you if you didn't pick up on this, because we understand that silver chloride is not soluble in water, right? It actually is. You have. You have been, but you understand this, right, guys? That really, as you proceed through your education, especially in the sciences, it's simply the process of undoing the lies that teachers told you previously, right? So back in your ninth grade science class, you learned that atoms look like, um, like solar systems, right? And there's the nucleus and the electrons travel around the outside like planets. And then you learned in biology, which was also a lie, that they're in rings and it goes two and eight and eight and eight. And then you found out that was a lie. And then you understand that this is more accurate, but even that's not perfect. So guys, really what we're doing is we're finding models. So relative to this idea of silver chloride dissolving in water, what's going on? And the answer is this. We treat silver chloride as if it doesn't dissolve in water. But guys, you got to get comfortable with the ambiguity. All things dissolve in water a little. So do this. Look at the molarity. Guys, how many moles of silver chloride are we talking about dissolving in water? like a hundred thousandth of a mole? Yeah, it is, right? One, two, three, four, yeah. So understand that we treat silver chloride as being non-soluble because practically it precipitates and it's, to our understandings, that's the best way to think about it is if it doesn't dissolve. Understand that in chapter 17, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what we call slightly soluble salts. And frankly, silver chloride is one of those. And what we can do is we can actually undo this and go back and talk about if you have silver chloride precipitate trapped um, under water, how much of it actually does dissolve? And we're going to do those calculations. And the molarity ends up in like the hundred thousandths of a molar. So does it dissolve a little? Practically, we treat it as no, but because it does dissolve a little, there's an energy involved. And that's what I want to talk about in a minute. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Okay, so continuing to the east, Maddie, what do you got? 29. Hold on. You are answering it as if what? Okay. So, yeah, can, can, can we talk about some general principles here rather than, than swatting at specific examples? Is that okay? So, guys, and actually, Kate and I talked about this before school today. I understand that at this point there's traditionally confusion about work and heat. Um, but guys, remember, after the conversation that we had last time in class, and I know this sounds sort of comical, we're not going to do any work in this class. And guys, that's really, I know, hey, we're done. Uh, but guys, really, that is the case. How do chemical reactions do work? And the answer is typically by expanding. And when they expand, they push. We have force against a resistance. We have distance against a resistant force, and that's work. But guys, understand that when we do chemistry in this class, we allow the reactions to happen. Remember the word open container? And the gases just go into the atmosphere, functionally not changing the pressure. And as a result, we can discount work. Now, guys, do this thought with me. What do we call heat? in the absence of work, enthalpy. And that's how we're going to think about this. So if you're muddled with this idea of the interplay of work and heat, no, I, I understand, and, and that's exactly my point, is the thing that makes 29 tricky, and you see the picture right there, is it's not an open container, and we've got a heating element, and we've got a piston, and we've got all this other stuff going on, and understand, I included the question in the homework because it's, it's an important idea, but it's not important to the AP curriculum. Um, I, I still feel at some level a little bit of a need to expose you to ideas outside of the AP curriculum, knowing that many of you are going to become physicists and chemical engineers and things like that. So I at least want to sprinkle a little bit in there, but frankly, don't worry about it. Just if you understand that heat is the flow of energy as hot things run into cold things, your money. Is that okay? Yeah, it's really just that. So, continuing to the east. Kate. Can, can we talk about 45? All right, so guys, this is actually where I would like to transition. Um, oh, energy diagram? Huh? You're getting used to the idea, though, that elevation is analogous with energy. So if you're going down, you're losing energy. Um, but then, guys, getting to these questions down here. Um, we did not directly talk about these in class. But I, I'd like for you, would you do this with me? Would you physically look at question number 45 in the book? Because, guys, this becomes our jumping off point to what we're going to do in just a minute. So guys, looking at question number 45, um, you've got, and I'll actually take a second and write it down. You have, and, and again, guys, we, we touched on this and then ended class last time. We have, uh-uh. I Oh, there we go. No? Oh, there we go. Okay. So guys, we have what is called the thermochemical equation, and it looks like this. We've got silver ion reacting with chloride ion, and that forms silver chloride. And then we have a delta H value, and that delta H value is negative 65.5 kilojoules. So guys, let's talk about this briefly so that you understand what this means. And then we're going to spend the rest of the day today talking about where this comes from. So this is what is called the thermochemical equation. And it simply means this. If you take one mole of silver ion, and if you allow it to bond with one mole of chloride ion, you will get out one mole of silver chloride. But when we do that, there is an energy that is involved in the process as well, and that energy is 65.5 kilojoules. Now guys, with that said, there are some things that we need to talk about. First of all, this. Is the energy going in or coming out? 
how do you know it's coming out? Because the value is negative. And so guys, remember, we are in the system, and most of the times in this class, our system will be the atoms involved in the reaction. So guys, this is losing 65.5 kilojoules of energy. So is this endo or exothermic? It's exothermic. So you don't need to do this, but the way that we'll represent this is we'll say that heat is a product. Heat is being released as well. But guys, here's an interesting point that we didn't talk about last time that we need to. Where is the heat coming from? Yes. Guys, tattoo this on the back of your eyelids. Any time a bond forms, energy is released. And guys, in this class, we thirst for always and never statements, right? But guys, this, this you can take to the bank. Any time a bond forms, energy is released. Every single stinking time. So guys, when the silver ion bonds to the chloride ion, the formation of that bond releases heat, releases energy, and the bond forms. So guys, what is it that, allow, that can allow us to say with such certainty that any time a bond forms, energy is released? How does that thinking work? Why the certainty? Did you not pick up on this in, in your reading? Does anyone just want to hazard a guess? Do you understand the question? What is it that allows us to say with such certainty that when a bond forms, when a bond forms, energy is released? Good night. Those are the kinds of energy, but still, what is it that allows us to say it with certainty? Yeah. Okay, so and that's how bonds form, through the transition of electrons, right? But how do we know that energy is always being released? Isaac. It's actually not work. It's actually being released as heat. Maybe, but we're not quite there. Guys, the answer is actually an argument in the counter. So guys, the, 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 the reason that we know that this is true actually begs the question, why do bonds form in the first place? Why does silver bond to chloride? And the answer is this. Silver ion and chloride ion have more energy than silver chloride. Guys, the answer to this riddle is actually the riddle itself. How do we know that energy is always released when bonds form? Because that's why bonds form. Bonds form because it allows the system to lose energy. And guys, when we get into chapter 19, we're going to talk more about this. But fundamentally, you've got to understand this. Anytime a bond forms, energy is released because that's what causes bonds to form is bringing atoms together in such a way that they release energy. If you bring atoms together and their energy goes up, the bond will not form. Do you see how that logic works? So guys, fundamentally, anytime a bond forms, energy is released. You good on that? Okay. Have any of you taken AP Biology? No? Or even regular biology, where they talk about ATP being an energy storage molecule. And you've all seen these videos where there's ATP, and the bond breaks, and it becomes ADP, and energy is released, and that's the energy of life. You know what I'm talking about? Guys, that's actually completely wrong. When the bonds in ATP break, energy goes in. Energy is not released. It's the formation of the ATP that actually releases energy. When ADP bonds to another phosphate, that's when the energy is released. When that bond breaks, energy is actually absorbed. 
So now you're going, what the crap? Why do they teach it to us like that? And the answer is because they don't want to talk about all the chemistry. Guys, the place that the energy is actually released is when ATP and the products of that turn into products. So it's the products that are forming that release the energy that's more energy than breaking the bond in the ATP. We'll talk more about it in a while. But guys, understand fundamentally, when a bond breaks, energy goes in. When a bond forms, energy is released. You good? Now are you mad at your biology teachers? Told you, guys, all science teachers are liars. We just undo the lies later and later in your career. And eventually you get your PhD, and then you just know less lies than all the rest of us. There you go. So, guys, um, so with that said, are we comfortable with this idea? Because here's what we can do with this. We, oh, shoot. We can do math. Because um, we can come along. No, no, no. Don't quit. Don't quit. Yeah, because we can use these numbers and we can do math. And we can say that for every mole of AgCl that's formed, we have 65-ish kilojoules of energy being released. And just like we can do mass-mass problems, we can do mass-energy problems because we know a molar relationship. For every mole of this that forms, that much energy is released, and we can use that in dimensional analysis to figure out energies. Is that enough for question 45? You guys okay? All right. So guys, with that said, we are not going to record your homework scores today because I want more time to do what we're going to do today. We will record these scores on Friday um, and a little bit of the homework we're doing. So guys, you are going to need probably, well, if you're going to need two sheets of note paper today. Um, it could be front and back. Or if you like to just only write on the fronts, you're going to need two. You do, of course, realize what this means, that we're not recording homework scores. I don't have to hit pause. I know, one less thing for me to screw up. All right, y'all. The topic, oh, your notes for today is calorimetry and Hess's law. Okay. No, these are actually mine. I know. I know. Although, actually, I think she got her printer fixed. Good, good day. So, guys, calorimetry and Hess's law. So, let me explain to you way, the way that this is going to go. Um, so, we are actually going to talk about these sort of in, well, in reverse order. So, here's the big question that we're going to pursue. Um, I think this... Cleared, yeah, it's gone. Um, so guys, we had that, that thermochemical equation on the board that said Ag ion plus chloride ion yields silver chloride, and we had an energy associated with that, and, uh, and, and we talked about what that means. Guys, today what we're going to do is we're, we're going to talk about where do those numbers come from? How do we know that 65-ish kilojoules of energy are released when a mole of silver chloride forms? And guys, the answer is two-pronged. It can either be through experimentation or it can be through calculation. So guys, let me show you what I'm talking about. So it goes like this. And I'm going to suggest maybe you don't write this down now, but let me explain to you what I'm saying, and I need to get this out of the way. Okay, so guys, the question that we're asking is this. Where do those numbers come from? And again, you don't need to write this down. This is just structuring thoughts. Where do those numbers come from in these thermochemical equations? When X and Y make W and Z, how do we know how much energy is gained and lost? But guys, first of all, before we get into this, we should make sure you're firm on this idea. 
where does the energy fundamentally come from when this reaction takes place? You tattooed it on the back of your eyelids. The formation of bonds, right? You know what, guys? I was going to skip this, but I'm feeling like maybe that's a mistake because of your hesitation. So we're going to take a step backwards. I thought I was going to skip this because it, it, was, it was because of our silver chloride conversation. You were there, but I don't think you are. Don't write this down, but let's make sure you're clear. So, guys, we will be solving questions like this that say things like how much heat is released when 4.5 grams of methane is burned in an open container, da 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 and The only reason I bring that up is it gave me the opportunity to show you a thermochemical equation. And, guys, this thermochemical equation goes like this. A mole of methane reacts with, a mole of, with two moles of oxygen, and it makes two moles of water, and it makes one mole of carbon dioxide. And when that happens, there's about 900 kilojoules of energy involved. Is that going in or coming out? It's coming out, right? It's a negative value. We're in the system. Energy is coming out. Guys, this is the energy that heats your home and actually heats up your water when you're doing labs. Guys, methane, CH4, is the primary component of natural gas. So literally, these 890 kilojoules of energy per mole is the energy that gets blown throughout your home by your furnace that heats up your house. But guys, the question again is this. Fundamentally, where do those 900 kilojoules of energy come from? The formation of bonds. In what? The formation of bonds in the water and the carbon dioxide. Yes? So guys, the energy that comes, and this is math that we're going to be doing, so it's important you understand this. When hydrogens and oxygens bond together to make water, energy is released. When carbon and oxygen bonds together, energy is released. But guys, here's the thing that's weird. When two moles of water and one mole of carbon dioxide are formed, that does not give off 890 kilojoules of energy. It's actually more than that. Where does the other energy go? Yeah? It goes into breaking these apart. So guys, the idea is this. In the same way that energy is released when the products form, energy has to be absorbed when the reactants break apart. Because in order for CH4 and O2, in order for these to reorganize, in order to make water and carbon dioxide, guys, all of these bonds have got to break. And when those bonds break, does energy go in or out? Energy goes in. So energy is absorbed when the, product, when the reactants break apart. Energy is released when the products form. And it's the formation of these bonds that releases energy. Got to do this right. Guys, it's, sorry, it's messy. But it's the formation of those bonds that release energy. It's the destruction of these bonds that absorb energy. And the difference between destruction and creation is the 890 kilojoules of energy. Guys, this is where we're going next week. Just a second. We're going to be able to quantify how much energy goes in when these bonds break. We're going to be able to quantify how much energy comes out when these bonds form. And the difference between them will be the 890 kilojoules. Go ahead, Ken. So you, you have, and, and I know that Isaac's brain was going there as well as we were trying to balance heat and work. And so you're right that when a bond breaks, and this is weird, but hear me out. When a bond breaks, you're right that there is a separation that comes, that, that comes as the bond breaks, right? And so when you hear that, you immediately think work is being done because we have movement against an attractive opposing force and that feels like it should be work. Now the thing that's weird is that this bond actually breaks before they separate. 
It's the breaking of the bond that allows the separation. Because realize there's no, there's no, nothing in the surroundings is physically coming in and causing force at a distance, right? We don't break bonds with little tweezers and pull the hydrogens off the carbons. So in that sense, there isn't work being done. What is happening, and we thankfully don't have to do this anymore in AP, they removed this from the curriculum, but we can still talk. Actually, what's happening is energy, because you understand that these are electrons, right? So energy is entering into these electron clouds and causing the electron clouds to restructure in such a way that the attraction becomes repulsion and the bond breaks. At that point, these things can then separate. And you're going to talk all about this your sophomore year in college, and you're going to learn about things called HOMO and LUMO, the highest unoccupied molecular orbital and the lowest occupied molecular orbital, and the energy difference between those determines whether a bond will form or not. I just blew your mind. You'll see your sophomore year, but that's actually what's happening is the energy of these orbitals are changing, and it's at that point that the bond disintegrates, and then they can move. Do you get the, yeah, yeah, weird, right? It's cool, though, yeah. Yeah, right, so let's do this. Uh, I think the gas is turned off. But you know as well as I do that I could fill this room with, with methane, right, with natural gas, and it's not going to turn into carbon dioxide and water until there's an initial input of energy, right? And that initial input of energy for us is the striker that we use to light our Bunsen burners, or in our furnace there's a little sparker. But there has to be an initial input of energy because if these methane molecules and if these oxygen molecules don't break apart, they can't reorganize. So you've got to add a little bit of energy to get a couple of these to break apart. Then they reorganize and then you end up with a self-propagating reaction because now we have free carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens. As they recombine, they release energy that then feeds backwards to break more methane and oxygen apart. But if we don't have that initial input of energy, nothing happens. Yeah. What do you all think? Sitting better now, breaking bonds, energy in, typically reactants, forming bonds, energy out, typically products. The difference between those is the delta H. Yo. Yo. <laughs> Josh, we know you're not here, but Cole concurs. Okay. He's here in spirit, we'd like to think. All right, so guys, with all of that said then, we can now come back to this and say, where does delta H come from? The breaking and forming of bonds. But then we still need to answer the question, how do we know? Where do we get these numbers from? And guys, don't write this down, but this is the organizing idea. We want to know, where do we get enthalpy data? And the answer is one of two places. We can get this data empirically. Now guys, let's pause. What does empirical mean? Measured in lab. Okay, we, I know empirical formulas, you think simplest formulas, but guys, empirical does not mean simplest. Empirical means measured in lab. And the idea with empirical formulas is in order to find an empirical formula, you take the molecule, rip it apart, and weigh the pieces. So guys, that's the connection with empirical formulas. But empirical means measured in lab, and the name of that process is what is called calorimetry. We're going to talk about that today. Then guys, there's another way for us to get these delta H values, and that is through a conduit that is called Hess's Law. And you're going to see that on the AP test, you are going to need to understand Hess's Law through a process called manipulation and through a process called computation. But guys, this is going to be, when do I see a Tuesday? This is, going, this, this is going to be Tuesday. So today we're going to talk about calorimetry and then the next time we're going to come back and talk about Hess's Law and the way that we find these values, not in lab, but out of books. All right. So guys, here we go. Before we do this, and this you've got to write down because it, it gets confusing. Guys, just write this down. So guys, in order, in order to get into calorimetry, which is functionally the measurement, empirical measurement of heat, eventually we're going to be doing some data analysis and we need equations. 
So as we do, as we learn to deal with heat in lab, there are two important equations that you need to know. The first one is called heat capacity. Guys, heat capacity is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise a system's temperature one degree Celsius. Don't even try to make sense of this. Just write it down. So, guys, let me give you the equation for heat capacity. And it's simply this. Oh, by the way, it's denoted H sub C. Finally, an abbreviation that makes sense. And guys, this is the equation. H sub C is equal to Q divided by delta T. So guys, once you're done writing this down, I would encourage you to jot a note probably off to the left of these notes. And you may want to make note to yourself. I, let me say this and then we'll figure out how to abbreviate it. Guys, this is not on the AP test. This is not a part of the AP curriculum. It's not on the equation sheet. You don't need to know this. The reason that we're talking about, we're not going to talk about heat capacity anymore until third period. So guys, heat capacity is not a part of the AP curriculum, but it's really important. We're going to talk about it in lab. So next to this, you might want to write down only in lab. So we are going to use this in lab, and you're going, to, you're going to love it. Guys, when we talk in today, third period, about what we're going to do in lab this week, you're going to be like, okay, that's really cool. Um, but guys, understand it's not a part of the AP curriculum. You can ignore this moving forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and guys, I, let's talk about that. So guys, you understand that, that chemistry is a big, it's a big pool, right? There's a lot of stuff out there that fits into the swimming pool called chemistry. And in general chemistry, we narrow that down frustratingly a lot, right? And you guys experience that because you're like, come on, let's talk about this. And we don't because we can't, right? But then that's even true at the university AP level. There's a lot of things that we could talk about, but it doesn't mean we do. Um, so you're going to see, like, for example, when you asked the question a second ago about this idea of work being done when bonds break, um, and I talked with you about HOMO and LUMO, right? HOMO and LUMO is not in this book, but molecular orbitals are. Lowest occupied molecular orbital, highest unoccupied molecular orbital. It turns out when like hydrogen and oxygen bonds together to form water, you know how the atoms have orbitals? So do the molecules. So in the same way that an atom is surrounded by all these spheres and clover leaves and all of this stuff, when atoms bond together to form molecules, they create a completely different structure of orbitals that have nothing to do with the individual atoms, but they surround the entire molecule. That used to be a part of the AP curriculum, and it's in the book. Um, but we don't have to talk about it anymore because they lifted it from the curriculum. So you're going to see that increasingly throughout the year. We're going to be like, hey, guys, this is in the book, but we don't need to worry about it because it's not on the test. Oh, no, not at all. So understand, this is, this is a college textbook. This is not an AP textbook. This, they, but that said, Eugene and his collaborators wrote a book um, that could be used for an AP class. But understand that when you get into your freshman chemistry class at whatever university you're at, they're going to be covering stuff that, that we won't talk about. Because while it's not a part of AP, it is a part of what these professors want you to know. So there's always going to be less and less distilling as you move further along. Okay, so guys, Again, in lab, right? Gone? Okay, the next one is not in lab. This is the one that you need to be able to manipulate and think about. And it's, oh, oh sorry, units, joules per Celsius degree. So Q is heat, joules. Ooh, Q is, yeah, is heat is, and, and joules. And then delta T, change in temperature, Celsius degrees. The one that you need to know is this. It's called specific heat. This is on the AP sheet. And guys, specific heat is defined as, and this is worth writing down, 
it's defined as the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. And some of you right now are going, wait a minute, I've heard of this. It's also the definition of a calorie if the substance is water. So the specific heat of water is one calorie per gram. So it takes a calorie of energy to raise a gram of water's temperature one degree Celsius. And all substances have different specific heats. So guys, moving along, the, uh, the, the abbreviation, sadly, for specific heat is lowercase c. That is, however, on the AP equation sheet, so you don't have to memorize it. It's there. And then this becomes the equation that we use to quantify specific heat. I grew up calling this the MCAT equation. Did you guys... And I have no idea how, but it seems like every year I've got a couple of students that have heard of this. Have you, did, is it familiar at all? Yeah, you, where did you learn it? In physics? Say it again. Was this in general physics or AP? Okay, so guys, we're, if you want a name to associate with it, I learned it MCAT. It's totally a, but it's simply mass, then C is the specific heat, and then delta T obviously is change in temperature, and Q, as always, is energy. But then, guys, the units for this number are actually, oh shoot, they're not there. Um, I can give them to you, though. Well, actually, you can figure them out, but we can do it together. So, guys, solving this for C, you've got Q is equal to M over delta T. So the units are joules over grams uh, Celsius degrees. So it's the number of joules of energy needed to raise a gram of a, of a substance's temperature one degree Celsius. So guys, moving forward, notice this important point, and then we're going to draw a picture, and you'll be relieved to know it's not going to be a beaker. And not an Erlenmeyer flask. No, it's even better than that. Although in Utah County, some people will find this offensive, but we'll get over it together. So, guys, this then is an important idea. Do you remember when we talked about energy... Uh, maybe two times ago, actually last time, and we said that energy cannot be directly measured. Instead, what do we measure? Changes in energy, and what evidence do we have of changes of energy? Well, in this case, the answer is change in temperature. And we talked about that interesting idea that temperature is not energy, um, temperature is kinetic energy, it's, it's motion, right? Temperature is a measure of how fast these things are moving, and as their energy goes up, they move faster, and as their energy goes down, they move slower. But guys, temperature and energy are not the same thing, but change in temperature is evidence of a change in energy. Yes? Okay. So guys, with that said, here we go. We are now ready to talk about what is called Coffee cup calorimetry. In Utah County, we can call this hot chocolate cup calorimetry. But guys, understand that in the academic world, if you say coffee cup calorimetry, everybody knows what you're talking about. You can use this on the AP test. But actually, guys, the technical name for a coffee cup calorimeter is a constant pressure calorimeter. So I know that you've all been wondering since our very first day in lab, why the snap do we have those weird coffee cups in our drawers that are surrounded in, in co cozies? Know what I'm talking? Can you picture what I'm talking about in your drawers? There's like that weird foamy cup with a styrofoam cup stuck in it. No? Really? I know, we threw it away. I know, it had suffered a horrible death. But guys, all of those things are coffee cup calorimeters. So do not draw a thing, just absorb. Guys, these are the fundamental pieces of a coffee cup calorimeter. 
you have got a stacked nest of styrofoam cups. Um, we will use that, that soda koozie, cozy thing, and then another styrofoam cup inside of that. That actually creates some dead air space that insulates even better. And then guys, notice what we've got. We've got a sample that's down inside the calorimeter. That is going to be, uh, I shouldn't tell you, that's going to be our system. And then guys, you, in, in this coffee cup calorimeter, you're going to have some water. Then, coming through the top of the coffee cup calorimeter, you've got two things. You've got a thermometer and you've got a stirring device. Guys, our stirring device is not going to be an impeller. Our stirring device is actually going to be a piece of nichrome wire. And what we actually do is we take the nichrome wire and we shove it through the same hole as the thermometer. And then the nichrome wire has a loop on the end of it. Can't draw three dimensionally, but it's got a loop. And what you're going to do is you're going to move the nichrome wire up and down along the thermometer and that will stir the reaction. You get the idea? Okay, then let's draw it. So guys, drawing a coffee cup calorimeter. I know if I draw in black, you're going to confuse this with a beaker. Be creative. And guys, really, in all seriousness, what you want to do is this. Get a clean sheet of paper. You're going to make this big. If it's on the back, that's fine. That's why I said grab two sheets of paper. You want to make this big. And you're also maybe going to want to make it portable so you can take it to lab. But guys, fundamentally, it looks like this. So this is the beginnings of our coffee cup calorimeter then we are, we are not going to draw the nested things, but we understand that it's a styrofoam cup inside a foam thing. Then, guys, we're going to put a lid on this. In lab, your lid will actually be a piece of cardboard. It doesn't seal tight. It works just fine. Then, guys, you're going to put a hole in your, um, in your calorimeter. Then, guys, into that hole, and this is where things get really sketchy for me. A, get it, sketchy? Can you let that be a thermometer, please? Thank you. All right. Get back to me if, you're not, if that's not all right. Then, guys, around this, we are then going to place a nichrome wire like so. And guys, by the way, when you build this in lab, you're going to find it's easier if you take the top of your nichrome wire and throw a 90 degree bend in it, then it gives you something to hold on to while you jiggle. Then guys, what you need to do from here is you got to add some Wawa. All right, so now that you've got all of this done, what we need to do off to the side is we need to answer some questions. First of all, what is our system? Second of all, what is our surroundings? Third of all, what are we measuring? And fourth of all, how are we going to do these calculations? So, guys, answering these questions, and I know I already gave you the answer to the first one, but we can talk anyway. In a coffee cup calorimeter, what is your system? And the answer is the atoms and molecules involved in the reaction. So I'm just going to summarize that, and I'm going to say that the system is the reaction. Now, guys, with that said, let's be a little bit more specific, but I would encourage you not to write this down because it's going to become clutter. In the lab on Friday,
in the lab on Friday, your system is going to be acid-base reactions. You're going to uh, react sodium hydroxide with a strong acid, and then you're going to react sodium hydroxide with a weak acid, and you're going to compare the energies that are generated in both of these reactions. That will be your system. Then guys, coming back after that lab is over, we're going to do this entire lab completely over. Only in the second trial of this lab, which will be later next week, you're going to write your own procedures. At that point, your, your system is going to be a salt breaking into ions. And again, guys, I encourage you not to write this down. I just wanted to present that to you now. So guys, that is going to be your system, the, the reaction. Then the question becomes, what is your surroundings? And what do you guys all know the answer is? Everything else, but that's not true. Now guys, I remember it might have been Christian, but some, or maybe Cade, but somebody over here, when we very first started this unit, we talked about the idea of open and closed systems. Now guys, be careful. Not open container, right? Let's be careful. What does an open container allow to get out? Everything. The law of conservation of mass does not hold with an open container because gases go away. Why do we care about gases going away? Because then work can't be done. So an open container is not the same as an open system. So guys, let's remind ourselves, what gets in and out of an open system? Matter? Only energy, right? So guys, do you remember when we talked about open systems and closed systems? And then Christian, was it you or maybe Cade that talked about that third kind of system that you read about that I'd never heard of before? Do you remember this? Isolated systems? Do you remember that idea? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a cool idea. I can't wait to use it. Oh, I said it backwards, didn't I? Sorry, open lets matter out, closed doesn't. So our systems are closed. So closed systems, open containers, right? Yeah, sorry, I said it backwards. So guys, isolated system, and this is important. I've never called it this before, but guys, here's the idea. Put something at the bottom of your, your calorimeter that is our reactants. Now, guys, let's do this. Let's say for instructional sake that whatever it is that's reacting is exothermic. If it's exothermic, or is, is it gaining or losing heat? If it's exothermic, is it gaining or losing heat? Losing heat. Where does it go? Into the water. So, guys, when this reaction takes place, and I would encourage you to write this down, heat, Q, is lost into the water. But guys, what we are going to do then is we are going to say that that is the only place the energy goes. And you understand as well as I do that this energy won't just go into the water, it will go into the thermometer, it will go into the stirry thing. It will go into the air. It will go into the, 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 the coffee cup. It's going into everything. And guys, if you were to carry out a reaction inside a styrofoam cup, and if it got hot, if you came back tomorrow, it wouldn't be hot anymore, right? You got a cup of hot chocolate and it burns your mouth and you come back an hour later and it's the same as room temperature, right? So guys, you know that energy does get through styrofoam. But what we're going to do is this. We are going to say that this styrofoam cup isolates the calorimeter from the surroundings. And if the calorimeter is isolated from the surroundings, then the part of the surroundings that we care about is only the water. This is the difference between class and lab. 
Okay, so we understand that practically that the pieces of the calorimeter, the thermometer, the sturdy dude, um, the air, even the cup itself does absorb energy. What you're going to see in AP is that when they write these questions, there's always a line in the question that says, assume that all the energy lost by the reaction is only absorbed by the water. At that point, our surroundings become only the water. In lab, we're going to deal with the fact that that's really not the case, but we're going to talk about it in lab. Not now. Okay. So, guys, then the question becomes this. Imagine this. Can you imagine doing this reaction? And, guys, if this, if this reaction is exothermic, what evidence are you going to have that the reaction is losing energy? Say it again. Okay, thermometer, but guys, what are you going to see change? The temperature of the water will go up, right? That's our evidence of energy being exchanged. So guys, the thing that we are going to measure is the temperature, and specifically the temperature change. But guys, the temperature change of what? The water and guys, this is where this gets confusing because the water is our surroundings, right? The water is not our system. So if the water is gaining energy, what happens to the system? It's losing energy. And what do you know from the first law of thermodynamics is true of the amount lost and the amount gained? They're the same. And so guys, the idea is this, and I'm gonna move my word calculation down. All of this hinges on the idea that the Q lost by the reaction is equal to the Q gained by the water and vice versa. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure and calculate the amount of energy gained by the water and then we're going to say that that's equal to the amount of water, amount of energy, in this case, lost by the reaction. Do you understand that logic? It's critical. So guys, if you understand that, then the last question that we need to ask is how do we do the calculations? How do we figure out how much energy the water gained? And guys, the answer is this. How do you do this? M, M cap? Guys, that's the equation. We need to know the mass of the water. We need to know the specific heat of the water. We need to know the change in temperature of the water. And when we know that, we can calculate the amount of energy that was gained by the water, which is the same as the amount of energy lost by the reaction. Let's call time out. This is what you need to understand in order to move into lab. What questions do you have? You guys okay? Okay. So, guys, what I want to do is, well, it's up here. Let me do this because I don't know what your time constraints are. Let me give you the, uh, the homework. Um, and if you want to get started on this, that would certainly be appropriate. Um, but, guys, we are not going to grade this next time. Um, but, guys, this is the homework that we will eventually do. Write it down. And actually, maybe I should show you this too because we, you may have more time. You may need more time. Because this is not due on Friday. None of this is due on Friday. This actually won't be due until next Wednesday. Is that right? No. When do I see you again? Tuesday, Thursday. This is all due next Thursday. Because on Friday, we're going to rewrite the test. Then on Tuesday, we're going to wrap this up. And then next Thursday, this will all be due. Um, but we're going to do Chapter 19 summaries the same way that we did Chapter 5. Some of you took some liberties with the way that you did Chapter 5. Many, a couple of you mucked them all into one grid. One grid per subsection, y'all. Um, but this then is due on Thursday. Let's take a break. Kate, did you have a question? Okay, so guys, um, let's take a break. Give yourself a couple extra minutes, but let's get back in a timely manner so that we can talk about lab. Go, go, get them, get them, go, go, get them. <laughs>